music. In recent years, music is being used more than ever before because of how easily accessible music is today with, you know, mobile devices and wireless streaming services. People are listening to music constantly. Might be listening on the way to work, uh, and during the lunch break, or in the elevator. I don't know. <laughs> Mopping the floors, maybe. All the time, basically. Research shows that people in the U.S. alone spend about 27 hours per week listening to music on average. That means an average American can be listening to over 1,300 hours of music per year. And no wonder. Listening to music has been proven to reduce pain and anxiety, lower blood pressure, release dopamine, and improve sleep, alertness, and memory. We're out of fingers there. So, besides being an artistic and emotional outlet, music is just powerful in general. So really, the influence that music has over us today can't really be overstated. Well, maybe it can. <laughs> you might be thinking, okay, okay, music is very influential. What's your point? Well, after coming to this realization, it kind of got me thinking, like, is music today as influential as it's ever been? And basically, the conclusion that I've come to, simply put, is no. Not by a long shot. And it's mostly because, like, availability and influence are not really the same thing. And just because science has discovered uh, many benefits of listening to music in the recent past, that doesn't necessarily mean that those benefits were born in the recent past. They were there, they were always there, regardless of our knowledge of whether they were there or not. Frankly, I could go on all day about all the times in history when music was a powerful force, but for now, I'd like to focus in on a very special time in human history, specifically American history, and that time period is the Harlem Renaissance. History.com describes the Harlem Renaissance as the development of the Harlem neighborhood in New York City as the black cultural mecca in the early 20th century and the subsequent social and artistic explosion that resulted. Lasting roughly from the 1910s through the mid-1930s, the period is considered a golden age in African-American culture, manifesting in visual art, literary art, and musical art. Of course, we're going to be focusing on the musical aspect, more specifically jazz and blues. You know, jazz and blues is kind of like the roots of most modern genres of music today. Uh, no, not those roots. Okay, let's, let's just forget the whole root thing, and let me rephrase. Many modern forms of music are influenced by blues and jazz, okay, and that includes pop, rock, country, and hip-hop. So first, let's talk about pop. Uh, what is pop exactly? Musical Dictionary describes pop as being music specifically designed for mass appeal and commercial success. It can have almost any kind of instrumentation and musical characteristics, but the main thing is that it needs to be catchy, upbeat, and, well, popular. There's one rule for pop music, though. Make it stick. Musically, that usually means a little syncopation in the rhythm, slick vocal harmonies, and not too much dissonance. In short, pop needs to be approachable, easy to listen to, and ideally it should get stuck in people's heads so they have to go back and listen again and again. Thanks, Musical Dictionary! Now that we have a clear understanding of what pop is and can recognize some of its features, let's examine how exactly pop was influenced by jazz and blues. See, jazz has various features and a vast array of rhythms to go with it. The most famous is the swing rhythm, which has been adapted into popular music and also transformed into the shuffle groove, often featured in blues. This syncopated rhythm really gets things moving forward with its infectious energy and brightness. Another interesting influence of jazz music is through producing. The best example of this is the collaboration between Quincy Jones and Michael Jackson for three albums, including Thriller, the highest selling album of all time. Quincy Jones had previously, sorry, previously worked as a trumpet player and an arranger with Frank Sinatra, Dizzy Gillespie, Count Basie, Duke Ellington, and many others. This strong jazz influence can be heard in Michael's melody lines such as Baby Be Mine, the spelling out of a minor ninth chord and beat its main riff, 
and the lady in my life's jazz-like arrangement. Rock. You may wonder how in the... Uh, no, not, not that rock. I'm, I'm talking about, like, rock and roll. Yeah. You might wonder how on earth rock is even remotely related to uh, jazz and blues, but trust me, the groundwork is all there. The connection between the genres is a little tricky to describe, though, and that's mainly due to the fact that well, rock music itself is nearly impossible to accurately label. Uh, there's like a general consensus that it's a form of music with a strong beat, but it's really tough to be any more concise than that. The Collins Cobuild English Dictionary suggests that rock is a kind of music with simple tunes and a very strong beat that is played and sung, usually loudly, by a small group of people with electric guitars and drums. So far, this doesn't sound anything like jazz and blues, does it? Well, rock adapted more of the spirit of jazz and blues more so than the sound. Although more often related to blues, ja rock has taken from the jazz in multiple ways. First of all, the biggest rock acts of the 60s and 70s, such as Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, Jimi Hendrix, Neil Young, and more, all used improvisation to a large extent and offered feature sections where a soloist would come up with material on the spot for an unplanned amount of time. And while common chord progressions weren't really that much transferred from jazz to rock, the musicians in the latter category didn't shy away from extending their chords with additional chord tones as jazz musicians tend to do. Country. No, I, no, wait, wait, wait. Will you quit it with these crazy images? Like, I don't know, give me a tractor, or, or the, the boat, or some whiskey. In 2019, South Dakota Public Broadcasting published an article called A Country Music and Jazz Connection, written by Carl Gerker. Gecker Carl. Carl made some great points when it came to the birth of both blues and country music, and even mentioned how famous artists from both genres work together at, from time to time. He said, Jazz and country are two distinctive American styles of music that don't really seem to have much in common. Country is dominated by vocals and simple chord progressions. Jazz is a primarily instrumental music with more complex harmonic structures. Country often reflects a rural experience, and jazz is more urban. Country is one of the most popular genres of music, while jazz has a small niche audience. But despite these differences, jazz and country share some similar roots. Both developed as folk music in the American South during the late and early 19th and 20th centuries, growing from sounds and styles in var various immigrant cultures and African traditions. Jazz and country became identifiable genres after World War I with the rise of the phonograph records and the radio boom of the 1920s. A good example of how arbitrary these categories can be sometimes is a record Jimmy Rogers made with Louis Armstrong in the 1930 Blue Yodel No. 9. Rogers is known as the father of country music and was very much influenced by African American music, especially the blues. Forty years later, Armstrong, not long after recording an album of country music in Nashville, joined Johnny Cash on the television special at, in a recreation of the classic record. Hip Hop Okay, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Finally, let's discuss rap and hip hop. There are lots of different like, subgenres but we're really just going to focus, focus on the origin of hip-hop. Hip-hop is a genre of music most often characterized by a strong, rhythmic beat and a rapping vocal track. The genre originated in New York City in the 1970s as a cultural exchange among Black, Latino, and Caribbean youth and has grown into one of the most consumed genres of music in the United States. As a culture, hip-hop is built on four main pillars. DJing, also called MCing, breakdancing, and graffiti. DJing, rapping, also called MCing, breakdancing, and graffiti. Hip-hop takes all the elements that jazz contains, like infectious rhythms and intense melodies, and develops it into something new. Just like with jazz, improv, or freestyling, is a lauded skill in hip-hop that allows rappers to express their thoughts and feelings on the spot in their music. It all comes back to improvisation. Whether you're playing jazz or rapping your own lyrics, you're able to communicate your feelings through music, which isn't that the whole idea? 
It's clear that during this artistic golden era in American history, jazz and blues established a blueprint for future genres to use for generations to come. But who were the people responsible for building that blueprint? Despite jazz being relatively niche at the time, there were several big name musicians and singers that played a huge role in music at that time. Some of those individuals were Louis Armstrong, Cab Calloway, Miles Davis, Duke Ellington, and Dizzy Gillespie. Louis Armstrong. Who was Louis Armstrong anyway? Well, according to the biography written about Louis Armstrong on louisarmstronghouse.org, Louis Armstrong was born in New Orleans, Louisiana on August 4th, 1901. He was raised by his mother in a neighborhood so dangerous it was called the battlefield. Well, he only had a fifth grade education, dropping out of school early to go to work. An early job working for the Jewish Karnofsky family allowed Armstrong to make enough money to purchase his very first cornet. Later in his adult life, the records by Louis Armstrong ended up being the most influential in jazz. Armstrong's improvised solos transformed jazz from an ensemble-based music into a soloist art, while his expressive vocals incorporated innovative bursts of scat singing and, under, and an underlying swing feel. By the end of the decade, the popularity of the Hot Fives and Sevens was enough to send Armstrong back to New York, where he appeared in the popular Broadway view, Hot Chocolates. He soon began touring and never really stopped until his death in 1971. Born Cabell Calloway III on December 25, 1907, in Rochester, New York, Cab Calloway's charm and vibrancy helped him become a noted singer and band leader. He grew up in Baltimore, Maryland, where he first started singing, and where his lifelong love of visiting racetracks took hold. A move to Chicago, Illinois, saw Calloway begin to study law at Crane College, which is now Malcolm X College, but his focus always remained on music. Later, in his adult life, Calloway learned the art of scat singing before, la before landing a regular gig at the Harlem's famous Cotton Club. Following the enormous success of his song Minnie the Moocher in 1931, Calloway became one of the most popular entertainers of the 1930s and 40s. He appeared on stage and in films before his death in 1994 at the age of 86. Miles Davis The National Endowment of Arts has this to say about Miles Davis. Born into a middle-class family, Davis started on the trumpet at age 13. His first professional music job came when he joined the Eddie Randall Band on St. Louis in 1941. In the fall of 1944, Davis took a scholarship to attend the Juilliard School, a convenient passport to New York. It didn't take him long to immerse himself in the New York scene, and he began working 52nd Street gigs alongside Charlie Parker in 1945. Soon, Davis found work with Coleman Hawkins and the big bands of Billy Eckstein and Benny Carter. During the 1940s, a number of fellow musicians began to meet and jam regularly at a small apartment of arranger pianist Gil Evans. Among them were the saxophonists Gary Mulligan and Lee Konitz, and the pianist John Lewis. Out of this group of musicians, Davis formed the Nonette to record his first major musical statement, Birth of the Cool. In addition to the standard piano, bass, and drums rhythm section, Davis's nonet horn, Davis's honet, nonet horn section, used French horn and a tuba, along with a trombone, alto, and baritone saxophones, lending the band a unique harmonic sound. Duke Ellington, the songwriter's Hall of Fame states, he was born Edward Kenny Ellington in Washington D.C on April 29, 1899, into a middle-class black family. His father was a butler in a wealthy household, and he is said to have sometimes worked at White House Affairs. Ellington originally had ambitions of becoming a painter, but he became interested in music in his early teens, 
and learn James P. Johnson's Carolina Shout from a piano roll. Soon, he was part of a small jazz band in Washington. Ellington was one of the most important creative forces in the music of the 20th century. His influence on classical music, popular music, and of course jazz simply cannot be overstated. Dizzy Gillespie. The University of Idaho Library reveals that John Burke's Dizzy Gillespie was born on October 21st, 1917, in the Chiraw, South Carolina. What is with these names? Dizzy was the youngest of nine children. He started playing the piano at four, the trombone at 12, and the trumpet at 14. For the most part, Dizzy was self taught. Gillespie was born into a family whose father, James, was a bricklayer, pianist, and band leader. Therefore, trumpets, saxophones, guitars, and pianos were all at Dizzy's disposal. Later in his adult life, Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker have been attributed with the development of bebop and the modern jazz. Dizzy appeared on a Lionel Hampton record date, playing a solo on a tune entitled Hot Mallets, which many observers believe to be the first recorded example of what would later be called bebop. In 1945, Gillespie formed his own big band with limited commercial success that showcased the concept of a big band bebop as a form of jazz. Whew, that was a lot of information, but it's important information because this was truly a remarkable point in American history. While still suffering the First World War, it was an apparent need to rebuild the morale of the nation. The, these iconic individuals that we just discussed, along with many more by the way, created something beautiful and fresh. Their music was so powerful that it began to break down the divide between the black socioeconomic classes and to a lesser extent, it brought blacks and whites together to enjoy a common interest. Their music helped to express the thoughts and feelings of African Americans who felt that they had no voice. Their music taught about the black experience, and their music helped people to cope with their grim situations. And isn't that really what music is all about? Transcending time and race and telling a story, uniting people around the world? While we can definitely say <laughs> That music created during the Hall of Renaissance did that. Can we describe modern music that way? Yeah, there will certainly be uh, differing opinions on that, and rightfully so. Uh, the influence of music today, as well as any time, varies from song to song, album to album, artist to artist, and genre to genre. Of course, just with any generation, there are some artists and styles that completely change the game. Music artists such as Justin Bieber, Rihanna, Drake, Taylor Swift, Kanye West, Nicki Minaj, Kendrick Lamar, Alicia Keys, J. Cole, Beyonce, Logic, the list goes on and on. They're all very talented and influential artists, and we have to give credit where credit is due. Actually, speaking of getting cr giving credit where credit is due, that segues nicely into my biggest and final point. There have been some amazing, successful, inspirational, and downright life-changing music that's been made just in my lifetime alone. But all those artists, they drew from somewhere. They got their inspiration, and they built upon something that was already there. They used something that exists previously, and they made something new with it. And while that's the very definition of innovation, and it's really no small feat. Even the most influential music ever released on earth could not exist without the foundation that came before it. Therefore, we can truly say that the echoes of the Harlem Renaissance continue to reverberate today. So, what do you think? Is music today as influential as it's ever been? I'd really like to hear what you guys think in the comments. By the way, Hi, my name's Curtis, and I wanted to thank you guys for watching my video. I worked really hard on it, and I spent a lot of time researching, developing, filming, and editing this video essay. But 
This video couldn't be possible without the hard work of countless men and women who made this information available for me and for you to research this topic. And to, so to ensure that those beautiful people receive the credit that they are due, all of my sources are listed below. And on that note, thanks for watching again, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Ja, mata.